Here's an idea. Welcome to Night Vale shows us how uncomfortable we are with the unknown. Night Vale is a small desert community where the sun is hot, the moon is bright, and strange lights pass overhead as we all pretend to sleep. It's also a podcast, a very popular podcast, the most popular podcast in America, actually. It's written by Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner and voiced by Cecil Baldwin, who shares his first name with the main character, the host of Night Vale's local radio news program. However, the daily news happenings of Night Vale aren't exactly quotidian. Well, I mean, for Night Vale they are, like the taco places encased in amber and all of the wheat and wheat byproducts have turned into snakes. Night Vale radio station management is an unseen horrible thrashing beast, and the hooded figures that you see around town are headquartered at the dog park, which you shouldn't go to or think about. And Cecil, oh Cecil, reports all of these shenanigans with his usual good cheer. One death has already been attributed to the glow cloud, but listen. It's probably nothing. The creators of Night Vale have made this mysterious, engaging, and funny podcast using most notably, though not solely, the characteristics of horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft was an American novelist who lived in the Northeast in the early 20th century, and he wrote stories, many stories, about how the universe, its machinations, and far-flung inhabitants are so dreadfully, horrifyingly, and infinitely beyond human understanding. He created The Great Cthulhu, wrote about impossibly shaped ancient underground cities and characters who are not even a little what they seem. And while Night Vale hasn't borrowed so much directly from the Lovecraftian universe, it has borrowed much of Lovecraft's spirit, specifically a spirit which embraces and makes masterful use of the unknown. Lovecraft's unknown is, unsurprisingly, in service of boot-quaking, sanity-losing, forever-seeing horror. In fact, Lovecraft saw his main contribution to the art of horror writing as just that, capturing the ways in which a real person might actually react if they are confronted with something literally impossible given their experience and understanding of the world. Philosopher Graham Harmon describes Lovecraft as a writer of gaps, a gap specifically between what we understand to be possible and what the characters are experiencing in the stories, expressed by the gap between the existence of something and the ability of language to accurately and appropriately describe that thing. Lovecraft and much of Night Vale is constructed of language dancing in compromise around situations it was not meant to apprehend. In Night Vale, though, paralytic terror is replaced with a sense of almost drab mundanity. I mean, sure, street cleaning day is a horror beyond all comprehension, but as long as you run, run away, run as fast as you can, stay in, everything will be fine. You know the drill. Night Vale undoes Lovecraft's central innovation and turns unspeakable abomination into unremarkable absurdity. This, in turn, might be Night Vale's greatest innovation. I mean, when Lovecraft was writing, the world was a much larger, more mysterious, and unconnected place. Today, I f***ing love science, brain pickings, Wikipedia, Vsauce, Zay Frank when he's not lying. Here, the angler fish waves a lovely pashmina shawl just the size for an unsuspecting shrimp. Confront us daily with the strange and seemingly impossible. Our ubiquitous black helicopters and glow clouds. Which, by the way, all hail the glow cloud. And the constant dissipation of incumbent Mayor Pamela Winchell really that much weirder than a government organization that spies on its own citizens, a shrimp that can punch so fast it boils water, and Kanye West? I say no. It's not that we've become numb to the peculiarities of the world, but rather like Cecil and the citizens of Night Vale, we've come to expect and kind of just deal with them. I mean, we've seen it all. But the reverse is also true, and is a sentiment perfectly captured in a Susan Sontag quote that Brain Pickings actually recently posted. Sontag wrote that needing to have reality confirmed and experience enhanced by photographs is an aesthetic consumerism to which everyone is now addicted. In short, seeing is not metaphorically believing. Seeing and believing are the same thing. We need the former in order to feel complete in the latter, or as we say on the internet, Pixar it didn't happen. Both Lovecraft and Night Vale rely on the facility of language and audio respectively to describe, and their inability to depict. In Lovecraft's time, this was maybe less of a compromise as visual culture wasn't the exceptional force that it is today. His work was minted both creatively and temporally outside of Pixar it didn't happen. For Night Vale, it's different. It's special for its lack of canonized depiction, and even its in-universe hostility towards the idea of seeing is believing. I mean, mountain believers. Right? Ugh. This, interestingly, is at odds with the practices of a modern fandom. Cecil specifically is described as not tall, not short, not fat, not thin. His smile is 
Is that even a smile? He possesses a set of characteristics so diaphanous that language passes right through them. Cecil and the rest of Night Vale are at odds with our desire for visual confirmation. This makes it hard, sight unseen, to believe in him. What's more, this makes it impossible to cosplay as him, or to cosplay as an immediately identifiable signifier of him. And this is a problem because Night Vale's fandom is large and excited and involved. So the gap must be transgressed in order to show it the fan respect that it deserves. Or in other words, cosplay, or it's not a fandom. Enter the emergent depiction of Cecil, a non-canon fan-imagined composite signifying that which is ultimately unknowable. How did we get this Cecil, the Tim Gunnish looking character who is definitely tall and definitely skinny with the tie and the tattoos? Maybe it's the real Cecil's voice, or maybe it's the skill with which Fink and Craner are able to evoke the surroundings. That is the power of radio, which they do say is the most visual medium, and by they I mean a vague yet menacing government agency. Either way, this isn't Cecil. It isn't. No depiction of Cecil is Cecil. Cecil is a voice. Cecil is as beyond language as the things on which he reports. He is an unknown in the world of knowns. He is a description in a world of depictions. And as bizarre and defying of description as he is, we still try. And maybe we do it because of fan culture or because it's fun or because if we don't, he doesn't exist or doesn't exist in a way that we're comfortable with, which means maybe we are a little uncomfortable with the unknown. Maybe it is a little scary, though certainly not as scary as Street Cleaning Day, because nothing is as scary as Street Cleaning Day. What do you guys think? Does Night Vale show us how much we want visual confirmation of the unknown? Let us know in the comments, and good night, Idea Channel subscribers. If I were a titan shifter, my titan form wouldn't knock down walls, it would knock down preconceived notions of popular media. Let's see what you guys had to say about Titans and evil. First and foremost, I just got back from uh, XOXO in Portland, which was an amazing good time. So hello to everybody who I met there. Uh, Martin, Lucy, Claire, Ben, James, Matt, Mike, Jen, a bunch of other, I'm gonna forget everybody, so I'm gonna stop trying. But it was great to meet you and say hi on the internet. Daniel Hoff says that the Titans from Attack on Titan are only as evil as meat eaters and that the show might be a case for vegetarianism. Uh, Corinthio X says that it might not be meat eating itself, but uh, the needless slaughter of animals. So that's, yeah, an interesting take on it. Keyminer says that with the information we have from the anime, you cannot say that the Titans are anything other than neutral, but most importantly banishes everyone who posted spoilers from the manga to a million years in a dungeon. Totally agree. Lego Maple makes the case that normal Titans are not evil at all, but that the shifting Titans are definitely evil and says that it is a mistake to compare Eren with the other shifting Titans. That, that might, there might be something to that, yeah. To Dustin Bell, thank you for the pronunciation guide. Hey, geography, like, hey, geography? I should probably just read a dictionary. To Lon McGregor, I don't know if there's a part of the human brain that craves meat, but the thought about hunting is definitely a salient point. Uh, there is actually a species of pigeon that the humans have hunted to extinction. So are we evil for doing that? I think some people would certainly say yes. Omar Achiha draws a really good connection between Saiyan children from Dragon Ball Z and what happens to them when they see the moonlight they turn into those big ape creatures, though I think uh, Lego Maple might disagree with this comparison. Evan Saborin and I are kind of on the same page regarding what you learn by reading the rest of the manga, which I have spent a lot of time doing, and that even when you know everything, it's still kind of a hard question to answer. But anybody else who's read it, uh, don't write a comment because you'll spoil it, never mind. Rodenoma asks whether or not capturing and experimenting on Titans is in itself evil. I, this, may, this might align with how you feel about animal experimentation in general. Thanks again, Funimation, for being really understanding, and to anyone who wants to watch Attack on Titan, we put a link to the watch page in the description. You go click it. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these destructive toddlers, and the tweet of the week comes from Buccino, who points us towards a Tumblr that will replace television. There is also a runner-up tweet of the week from Frequent Beef, who points us towards a Clive Thompson article about thinking in public, which is really interesting. And though I haven't read it, I have heard that Clive Thompson's new book is killer, so be sure to check that one out, too. Wow.